This is chapter 18, aseptic techniques. The purpose of aseptic techniques is to keep from introducing the pathogens we talked about in the last chapter that lead to infections from getting to the patient or to a healthcare worker. Here are your objectives. In radiology, you'll need to learn how to create a sterile field and work around a sterile field. In the nosocomial infection presentations, you'll learn what kinds of infections can happen in hospitals to those um, who are vulnerable and by not keeping things clean, sterile, and disinfected. You, can, uh, you need to learn how to gown and glove without contaminating the gloves or the gown inadvertently. And it might look like it's easy, but it's a lot harder than it looks, and we'll practice that in class next week. <clears throat> it would be unusual to have to change a dressing or care for a tracheostomy, but you do need to understand that you um, that you can ensure keeping pathogens away from the patient properly. Um, we all need to know how to dispose of contaminated waste correctly so that um, others aren't infected. So just keep in mind we're we're all part of a team and we'll have to work together. So occasionally you might be put in a position to have to help somebody with one of the with dressings or tracheostomies, but Typically, no. Healthcare associated infections are some of the reasons um, the national patient safety standards exist. Um, insurance companies no longer reimburse hospitals for the additional costs of infections patients acquire while they're in the hospital. Because a lot of times the patient gets the infection because aseptic techniques and hand washing uh, were not handled properly. As we talked about in the last chapter, everyone is vulnerable to pathogens. Patients who are particularly susceptible are those who, um, with burns and their primary barrier, which is their skin that protects them, is missing. In patients who have invasive procedures of one type or another with various things being inserted into, into them, are vulnerable to pathogens being introduced into their systems. Um, I think we talked about iatrogenic um, infections, which, which are doctor-induced types of infections. <clears throat> it is our responsibility to protect the patients from infections. This is why I'm so particular about you all getting into the habit of hand washing and gelling and wiping down your equipment and, and your patients um, after you touch your patients. Um, you need to understand what the difference is between clean, sanitized, disinfected, and sterilized. On page two, 226 in your patient care book is um, a good uh, concise explanation of what each of those is. There are These are the sources of microorganisms that can infect all controllable. What is a fomite? We talked about that in the last chapter. Um, they are objects contaminated with microorganisms that can spread. One of the reasons your long hair needs to be pulled back when you're in clinic um, and up is so that you don't spread germs from your hair to your hand to your patient. Um, skin can have pathogens colonized on it, um, just waiting for a host. Uh, Cross-contamination, wash your hands before and after patients or gloving. The most effective way to ensure you're not spreading infections from one patient to the next is washing your hands. Surgical asepsis. asepsis. This is um, protecting against infection before, during, and after surgery used by using sterile techniques. That means you have sterile fields, the sterile rooms, sterile equipment, and techniques including the room temperature, which is usually pretty cold in surgery. Um, all of these help protect, protect against in, um, infections when the patient is really vulnerable during a surgery. Medical asepsis, the removal of or destruction of infected materials. So the definition of that from the previous chapter is that you can reduce the number of infectious agents which in turn decreases the probability of infection but not necessarily to zero. The environment can be altered so that, it, so that it's not conducive to growth and reproduction 
by using antimicrobial agents, performing hand hygiene, wearing hospital garments, confining and containing soiled materials appropriately. For example, during barium enemas, you need to be sure that any towels or sheets or the barium bag, the tip, all of that stuff needs to be disposed of properly. And um, you need to keep the environment as clean as possible. So you use cavi wipes and to, to clean surfaces. This is um, your surgical medical imaging team. So when you, when you start doing surgery rotations and using the C-arm, uh, these are the people that are going to be on the team in the room. Uh, get to know who they are and pay attention to what they're doing so you can understand how the dynamic works in the OR. It will make you a much better tech. So the sterile field, um, <clears throat> microorganism-free area that can receive sterile supplies. Um, you need to establish the area using a sterile drape. And um, there are, everything needs to be clean and dry and unexpired and unopened only. You could, because if something is wet or has been opened previously, you don't ha have any idea whatever happened to that prior to you setting your eyes on it. So you need to know um, for sure, 100%, that the materials and supplies you're putting out are unopened Unex unexpired and remain in a sterile state for the patient's safety. Um, in the surgery, the sterile corridor is the area between the patient drape and the instrument table. So um, you don't ever want to go between the patient and the instrument table when you're in the OR. That's a no fly zone. You don't go there. Um, um, Procedures that you might perform that require a sterile field would be an arthrogram, hysterosalpingograms, myelograms, angiogram, lumbar puncture, biopsy procedures, those type of things. Any, any type of procedure where you're introducing um, a needle or some kind of instrument into a patient in an area that um, might be vulnerable to infection. Sterile draping. Always, always, always check expiration dates and the integrity of the supplies that you're using. They can't be wet. If they look like they've been wet at some point, then they're not sterile. Um, so we're going to practice um, opening sterile packs and having a sterile field in the classroom so you get a sense of what that's like. So um, not a whole lot to talk about with this. It's, it's better to do it rather than to um, just see pictures of it. So when you when you are establishing the sterile field, you have to lift the drape out in a specific way, open it without touching anything but the very edges or the bottom side that's going to touch the table. Um, another, uh, you use the corners of the drapes to make sure you can lay it out carefully. And then the surface that you put it on has to be clean and dry as well, which is another thing. Sometimes people don't always do that, but that's also a critical factor. Um, when you have to put supplies on the sterile field, you have to be careful in how you uh, put them on there as well. You need to um, be especially careful that you don't hold it too high or too low. There's a chance of touching, but there's also a chance of it dropping on the sterile field and then falling off the um, sterile field as well or knocking something else off that's already on the tray so be careful when you're doing this and I know once you get used to it you might try to move a little faster than you should but try to keep um, control of what you're doing pay attention and move a little bit slower so you don't drop things pouring sterile fluids into a sterile basin Hold the bottle with the label uppermost so that poured solution cannot stain or obscure the label. That's really important, especially if you're using something like Betadine, which is dark brown, and if it drips down the side, that it, that um, 
obscures the label, then you can't prove that it wasn't expired. You can't prove that that's what you're actually using. So there's a lot of reasons to keep that label from getting um, stained. Confirm that the solution um, is what you expect it to be before you pour it. Have someone else look at it um, is always a good idea. I know when you do procedures with a radiologist and you're using contrast or anything that you hold up for him to draw up the fluid, you have to show it to them first so they can look at it, make sure it's what they expect, and then they check the expiration date as well. So we'll learn how to do that um, this half of the semester also. Uh, sterile bas basins when you, that you pour the liquids into are generally placed toward the edge of the of the um, sterile field to avoid splashing over the entire sterile field. So if some of it splashes out, you remember you can't have things wet there, even though it's all sterile, but you'll have to clean up. And you don't want it to spill. If it spills, maybe it will fall off the edge instead of onto the whole tray. So be careful where you place it and um, be sure to hold the bottle only about six inches over the bowl. That should keep it from splattering. It also keeps it, the bowl from spilling. Um, pour the solution gently so that there, there's not the splashing. And um, let's see what else. The splashing of liquids can destroy a sterile field. So just keep that in mind. So take it easy with the pouring of the fluids. Take your time. Surgical scrubbing. Scrubbing means um, a sterile scrub. It's how what you use to clean your hands and how you do it and then how you dry your hands as well. So um, we will also practice this and um, the videos that I've included in this week's um, weekly work. You can look at and see how they dry their hands. I didn't put one up there for hand washing but I will um, see if I can find one. But it's a very specific way to scrub your hands to ensure that you're not still transferring um, microbes onto your hands and nails and forearms. Putting on a sterile gown. Sterile gowns now are just amazing. You can pretty much do them by yourself without too much trouble. You do need a little bit of an assist at the um, toward the end. Um, to tie to tie it and to help you wrap the, the um, belt around. Um, but uh, if you have an opportunity at your site to try it, it's really a challenge. I'm going to see if I can get some of those um, gowns that we can try. So you can do this two ways. You can gown self-gown or you can gown with another person. Um, after the gown is on and only the sleeves and front of the gown down to the waist are considered sterile. So that means you have to keep your hands and arms up above your waist. Anything below the waist is considered not sterile. So if you put your hands down, you have to start over because you're not sterile any longer. You can't guarantee you didn't touch something below the waist or below table level. So keep your hands up. You have to pass each other back to back too. If there are two of you in the room passing each other in a OR, the front of the person and the upper part of the person is always sterile, so you pass back to back. Sterile gloving will also do this. You can have you can help someone else put gloves on, or you can do it yourself. Um, you should have a sterile surface, or at the very least, a very clean surface. Um, so that you in case you don't um, get your contaminate your gloves at this point you need to arrange if you need um, to arrange the tray in a specific way if you've opened a tray for a procedure and your radiologist wants it set up a certain way then you would use sterile gloving um, for the most part you don't have to use sterile gloving there's also uh, ways to do it where you have one sterile glove and one unsterile hand where you can you know help yourself get the tray set up so you have one hand that can do the the picking up and holding of unsterile things and the other hand is sterile that can arrange the tray gloving over a sterile gown i also have a video on that and also much harder than it looks 
um, better to get someone to help you with this process, but it's kind of fun to practice it to see if you can get it done. And here's how you gown another person. The person doing the gowning in front, um, letter A, has to be sterile already. Otherwise, you won't be touching the front of that gown. So one, number one, the sterile person picks up the gown by the neckband and holds it at arm, arm's length and allows it to unfold. The gown is then held by the shoulder seams with the outside facing the sterile person. The sterile gloves are protected by placing both hands under the back panel of the shoulders, the gown's shoulder. The arms are slipped into the sleeves in a downward motion and sliding the gown uh, to the mid upper arms. Then a non-sterile person, a, sterile, a non-sterile circulator will pull the gown up and fasten the ties in the back and help you um, tie the waistband of the gown. And then you gently pull the cuffs over the person's hands, but you can't, but by not touching anything though. We'll practice that in class as well. Two-person gloving. I watched this last year. You you all need to be really uh, <laughs> um, think about what you're doing when you're having another person hold the gloves open for you so you can put them on. It um, it doesn't have to be as hard as you all make it. So we'll practice that also in class. It's kind of fun, funny to watch for sure. When you remove your sterile gloves. You really want to um, take them off so that they are inside out. When you pull the first one off, it'll be inside out, and then you hold on to it with your the one that's the hand that still has the sterile glove, and then you pull the other one over the top of that um, first contaminated glove. So they are together, and they turn inside out. So anything that's contaminated is well on the inside of the gloves. We'll practice that also. It's very, um, it makes a lot of sense when you're trying to keep your microbes and germs contained on your gloves. Dressing changes. As I said before, you don't necessarily need to be performing dressing changes, but you do need to know how to help with it. And at a minimum, you need to understand the process and uh, recognizing how many times you have to wash your hands in this whole process will be a benefit to you as well. As always, you're explaining the procedure to the patient, trying to keep them as comfortable as possible. Um, most of the time when you're doing things like this, it requires a timeout, which is making sure you've got the right patient, the right side, the right part, the right exam, the right everything, all the rights. Um, you never ever touch the dressing with your bare hands. So your hands are washed and clean, then you have your gloves on, you, and that's the only time you can touch the dressings. Wash your hands, patient privacy. Um, we're not gonna do all of this, but you need to know how to help. When you're putting a, a sterile dressing back on, you have to set up a sterile tray just like you would do with anything else. So you get your sterile field and you put your sterile supplies on there. You have your sterile gloves and then you can um, proceed with um, reapplying of sterile dressing always keeping in mind that you don't want to contaminate anything and get and uh, introduce any microbes into the patient that shouldn't be there tracheostomy is an emergency procedure um, if a patient's in distress when they can't breathe um, the doctors need to get an airway open this is um, when they do a tracheostomy Communication is really important. While you might you won't be doing this procedure and you don't have you have to be aware of keeping the area clean just like with anything else, but you might be the person who can um, talk to the patient and try to help keep them calm if you're not in the way. Uh, so that might be part of what you can do. Um, 
They still need to have the procedure exp explained to them and maybe more than once in their anxiety, they may not be listening as much as they, as they could um, in a different circumstance. And I'm sure you can imagine how scary this would be for, for anyone. And the risk of infection is so high that you never touch the tracheostomy unless you're using a sterile technique. Ideally, you would never touch it. De definitely leave it to the professionals in that area. You may need to assist with oxygen or with suctioning, but um, likely they, that won't have, um, you won't have to do that very often. And uh, I think there are more opportunities to have to deal with that when you're in CT or MRI. And uh, a lot of times patients who are in those situations have a lot of help that come with them to those procedures, but that doesn't mean you won't still need to know how to manage all of the um, tubes and lines and everything that comes with the patients. Uh, we talked about chest tubes in the previous chapters and the reasons why patients have them. Um, please watch the chest tube function video that I've listed here. It's a really great explanation of how a chest tube functions, what it, what it does and how it works. It, it was very interesting and that'll help you understand how it re-establishes the pr appropriate pressures within the lungs. Common insertion sites, as before, there these are the common insertion sites for the tubes, lateral and mid-axillary lines between the fifth and si to sixth intercostal space, depending on where the issue is and what kind of an issue it is. Um, can be a higher, can be lower. You guys are going to be the people who take the chest x-rays to ensure that the, ch the, test, the chest tubes are in their proper placement. And it's a good idea to be familiar. Um, I know I've said this before, the more familiar you are with where those tubes should be, the more helpful you'll be um, in recognizing your chest x-ray is done correctly. All right, chest drain, its drainage systems have three compartments to which chest tubes are attached. One of the competencies in DCP is to be able to work around patients' attached paraphernalia and not pull anything out or contaminate it. Patients are at the mercy of your attention to detail. So anytime you're doing a portable or a patient comes down with any kinds of tubes or bags or anything. You have to watch what you're doing and pay attention to the little stuff. Always use caution when moving things around. Um, also, if you note that there's a change during the time that you're with the patient, it's your responsibility to bring it to the nurse's attention. As always, you're part of the team caring for the patient, and um, it's important to remember that. Urinary catheters. In most instances, um, the rad tech doesn't catheterize patients. A radiologist will sometimes insert the catheters for VCUGs or radiology nurses may do it. Um, VCUGs are avoiding cystourethrograms. And um, you do those a lot of times with children. But anyway, you need to set up for the aseptic or sterile procedure and understand how all the catheters work and the different sizing and um, to help the radiologist or the nurse to get this done. The patients come into the department, sometimes the patients come into the departments with their catheters already in, but you may need to know how to take one out. They do have these balloons on them, so you need to be really careful. Fully catheter um, is the most common uh, urethral catheter, urinary catheter, um, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, one of the really common ones is they can't, re especially with men, is benign prostatic hypertrophy where the prostate has enlarged to a point where it's, uh, it doesn't allow um, the bladder to empty. So they'll have to get a catheter put in to empty the bladder. Indwelling catheter placement. Um, the tip of the catheter is in the urinary bladder cavity and then the, the tube is taped to the inside of the leg. And then the tube goes from there to a, 
a um, catheter bag that has measurements on it so that they can see what the patient's output is and if there's blood in it and or, you know things like that if there's changes making sure that they're well hydrated but these typically will have the um, balloons open all the time in the bladder to keep the tube from coming out always keep the drainage bag below the bladder of the patient if you don't then the urine will backflow into the patient you never want to do that so always keep the drainage bag lower than the patient's bladder don't put it on the bed put it below down lower when you're removing the catheter um, to allow the patient to void on their own um, you need to follow the same aseptic techniques as inserting the catheter because they're just as re um, susceptible to infection if when you're taking the catheter out as when you're putting it in. So you have to be sure not to expose it to any microbes. Um, patient's privacy and modesty is always critical, so be sure you keep them covered up the best that you can. Um, always, always, always deflate the balloon before removing the catheter. Be very gentle. People are so uncomfortable. So um, think about how you would feel and try to be sensitive to your patients in that regard. Intravenous and intraarterial lines. Central venous and arterial lines are um, also require sterile, sterile technique. You'll be required to take images for placement, just like with chest tubes. You may have to do more than one if the doc needs to change the catheter position. So um, you might be doing this with a C-arm or a portable machine. You must wear the required personal protective equipment or PPE as required for sterile procedure to protect the patient. When you're moving the portable machine or the C-arm, Know where your equipment is and where you need to position so that you don't run into any of the lines or tubes. This is part of your um, competencies as well. These tubes are really important not to touch and not to move. Pacemakers regulate the heart rate when the patient's electrical impulses are not functioning properly. Uh, usually they're placed in the upper right chest just under, under the skin. Uh, sometimes on women, they might be a little bit lower than that on the chest behind the patient's breast, so you may or may not see see it on a larger breasted woman, but for, for the most part, they're going to be in the upper left chest, and you can see them just under the skin. Um, your job with relation to the pacemaker is to operate the C-arm for the doctor to place the pacemaker correctly and make sure the leads are in the right place within the heart. Portable and surgical radiography. I don't know if you all have started going to the OR rotations. I think some of you have, but it's um, you're going to learn about sterile um, corridors and sterile fields and um, where you can and can't go, how to cover a portable unit in the OR to keep it sterile, um, surgical draping. I put um, a couple of videos on Blackboard related to draping the C-arm, and they're quite interesting, and one of them is um, how not to do it. So I want you to look at that and tell me what's wrong with that, with that picture. Um, I think the most common way to drape the C-arm is using the tension bands. They're kind of like a shower cap that, that wraps around the image intensifier and the, um, the tube. And there is a part that goes along the C as well that um, keeps it from, it keeps it sterile and uh, keeps the field around the patient sterile. There's another one that's a shower curtain wall drape that you have to see to understand it comes down on a on a rod and it comes across the patient 
um, down on one side. So the side where the C-arm and the tech are is not sterile. And the opposite side where the surgeon is, is sterile and over the patient. So the C-arm then can be moved in into the drape, but the drape side that's on the side of the patient is still sterile. So it seems like a really awkward way to manage it, but um, there's some good pictures of it on um, in one of the other books that I have. I'll bring it to class and so you can, you, it's not a book you guys have, so you can see what that looks like. It's kind of, um, doesn't seem like a very good way to do it to me, but I haven't been in surgery for 30 years. So um, let's see. Another way, which is not used very often, is just to put a sterile, another sterile drape over the patient's surgical site so that you can just bring the C-arm over without it being draped. So that's not optimal, but it um, it's doable if you have to. Neonatal portable radiography. No matter what you're doing in the neonatal unit, you need to ensure that you're not introducing the microorganisms to the patients or cross-contaminating the patients. When you shield the patients, there's a very high risk of cross-contamination. So you need to be sure to cover your gonadal shielding with a bag or something that is, that's clean, that's not going to um, cause infection in the patients. Cover your marker also. I know that a lot of um, techs put their right and left markers in a glove finger so that they can put it close to the patient without it touching them. So think about um, those small babies' immune systems and how delicate they are and what your, what your gonadal shield has touched and not been wiped off. So um, keep, a, keep them all covered as much as you can. When you are taking radiographs in the operating room, you need to dress appropriately. You need to be aware of your sterile areas. Know who your surgical team are and the float nurse so that you know who you're working with. And take responsibility for what you need to do and get in there and get your job done. Always be courteous and polite um, in communicating, even if the doc is yelling at you, which is not you know, terribly uncommon in surgery. Their doctors are pretty intense at that point, and they have someone's life in their hands, so they may not be pleasant when they're talking to you, but they need you to get your job done. So always be polite and courteous. Just communicate clearly with the operating room staff. You can't stand back and wait for an opportunity. If they say get the x-ray, you need to get in there and get it right away. Portables. I know you guys are doing portables. Um, always um, know your patient precautions before you approach them, even in the ED, and make sure you use the proper protection protocols. Um, always be sure to discard your gloves and gowns in the appropriate receptacles. You don't want to spread the pathogens to other healthcare staff by discarding your gloves in the wrong receptacle. So if you're in a room, you need to gown and glove in the room and then remove them before you leave the room so that it's um, so that you dispose of them properly and you don't walk out of the room and spread the germs anywhere else. All right, the purpose of the aseptic technique is to reduce the number of harmful or microorganisms. Surgical and medical asepsis are required for a variety of clinical uh, situations. And sterile techniques require proper gowning, gloving, and masking practices. And the technologist often has to perform in a surgical environment. You will have competencies in those in the surgery uh, area, so you need to be um, you'll get well trained in all of that. The techs in there are really great in making sure you know how to use that equipment. Um, and you always have to be aware of the patient's tubes, lines, pacemakers, catheters, urinary bags, all of that stuff. You have to be aware of all those considerations and make sure your equipment is clean and your hands are always washed. All right, chapter 19 is next.